Welcome to the Helping Conversation, an exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of facilitating trusting, safe, inclusive, and effective helping conversations with others. Recorded at RockVox Recording and Production Studios, Rochester, New York, mouth off at RockVox, rockvox.com. Having enjoyed an almost 40-year career facilitating his own authentic brand of the helping conversation, your host, executive and recovery coach, Keith Greer. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to sit in with me this morning on this episode of The Helping Conversation. It struck me uh, last week. I I, I don't know why I wasn't thinking about it, but I wasn't thinking about it until I was watching uh, some news show that I was sitting there uh, on the year anniversary of the world having closed down uh, due to COVID. And it, it really just knocked my socks off uh, uh, that a year had gone by, uh, that we have been living this way uh, uh, in fear with a certain level of anxiety, uh, many of us coping uh, with personal loss and tragedy and trauma. And um, it just it just seems amazing to me that we have, we have been at this for a year. And, and I do feel hopeful uh, that we're moving in a much more positive and uh, upbeat direction, that we will be at a different place uh, in a few months. But one of the very, very, very important conversations that, uh, as my guest will tell us today, in many ways we're just about to start, uh, is what has been the impact uh, of uh, COVID on our nurses uh, who uh, are, are, in many cases, are our front line uh, when people uh, come into a doctor's office, into a hospital, uh, and uh, they have uh, been taking the brunt of this uh, head on. Uh, and uh, we have all seen stories on the news, read stories uh, about the impact on hospital staff and on nurses in particular. But uh, today we're going to we're going to have a bit of a targeted conversation uh, about the impact. Uh, and uh, I was thinking the other day as I was preparing for our conversation today, uh, some of you might remember that uh, back in our first season, uh, one of our guests was Dr. Mick Krasner, who uh is a worldwide uh, expert on bringing mindfulness practices to the medical field, uh, doctors in particular, but nurses as well. And and Mick spoke uh, eloquently in in that episode about about the stress that doctors feel just just on your normal day, uh, and uh, and we can we can assume the stress that nurses feel just on a normal day pre-COVID. So uh, we know that the circumstances over the past year have been absolutely extraordinary. Uh, And as I uh, get into uh, our conversation today with our guests, let me just welcome uh, any of our guests who are uh, following us on Facebook Live on the Helping Conversation uh, Facebook page. We're doing a little bit of an experiment Uh, Scott and I, on uh, um, moving this podcast from simply uh, an audio podcast to putting it up and and, uh, making it available for folks in the moment to join us. And if if you are joining us, uh, uh, the possibility of of weighing in, asking a question, sharing your thought. So according to the Joint Commission, which is uh, uh, an organization that looks at all things healthcare, of the 2,000 healthcare providers who participated in an April 2019 National Nursing Engagement Survey, more than 15% of all nurses reported feelings of burnout. Now, remember, this was prior to COVID, with emergency department nurses at a higher risk. A second survey found that burnout is among the leading patient safety and quality concerns in healthcare organizations. Uh, quote, as the frontline caregivers in healthcare today, nurses accomplish a myriad of tasks and responsibilities, but often at a high personal cost. The need to juggle competing priorities in often high stress situations can re- result in feelings um, feeling overwhelmed and burnt out. The negative effect of these stressors can affect the ability of healthcare professionals to care for others. Uh, In another study by the Joint Commission in 2017 of 3,000 nurses worldwide, they found that the most common factors related to burnout are exclusion from the decision-making process, the need for greater autonomy, security risks, and staffing issues. Again, I want to highlight this is all pre-COVID. 
uh, I found this astounding of the five, only about 5% of the respondents in that survey said that their organization was highly effective at helping staff deal with feelings of burnout. That's a frightening statistic. And so with that in mind, uh, please join me in welcoming into uh, the Helping Conversation, D. Hake. Good morning, D. Good morning. Thank you for having me. I am so excited about this conversation. It is so relevant and so needed, and I'm thrilled that you were able to make the time to be with us. Uh, let me share with my listeners uh, a little bit about D. Uh, D is an advanced practice registered nurse currently practicing in the field of anesthesia. She's an exhaustion and burnout expert who's been in healthcare for over 16 years and has endured the many challenges the business of healthcare has created. From the early days in her career, she saw the tendency amongst nurses to neglect their own health and wellness in their effort to serve others. She's familiar with the selflessness that accompanies a career in a helping profession and has been a key contributor to both departmental wellness programs and hospital-wide initiatives to improve employee well-being. A true believer in the importance of provider health in health care, she's guided by the belief that healthy providers are the linchpin for excellent patient care. Dee founded Wellness in Healthcare and the Ending Exhaustion Course for Nurses with the goal to make personal wellness a higher priority for every provider. Focusing on the unique challenges and intricacies of work in a hospital setting, Dee helps nurses turn their intuition inward and shift existing habits and routines to better serve the provider and ensure their own optimal health and wellness. Through supportive conversations, gentle encouragement to dig beyond the surface, and explorative, explorative reflection, she's able to build a trusting relationship with her clients. We're going to talk about all of that. That's wonderful. Her authenticity, vulnerability, and guiding expertise create an ideal environment for a helping conversation that facilitates lasting change. Dee's goal is to empower nurses to take back their health and heed the advice they so freely give others in order to live a life they truly love. So again, Dee, thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. So I always ask my guests to start at the start. So here you are uh, 16 years into your career share just a little bit of, uh, of what that path has been like for you. Uh, so I started out, um, as a, as a new nurse, um, working in, I first worked in an ICU in a really busy, uh, busy area in North Carolina. And I worked there for a long time and then fate would have it. I found someone moved, moved long distance to be in a relationship with this person, um, and went through just being in the ICU. Um, and I went through my own experience with exhaustion and burnout, moving to a new place, um, and moving to a new, uh, facility that really didn't have the, the needed staff or the needed support in place. And I had my own incident, if you will, with, um, exhaustion and burnout at that time. And as I sought the resources and the help that I needed, I found this huge lack there there wasn't really much of what yeah. i needed or there wasn't the support in the community and there wasn't really any other resources other than here's your problem you're taking some time off from work you need to deal with this and come back um so i did that you know i figured out a way to work i figured out a way to make things work for me um and then i continued on as part of part of my plan was also to get more education so i went back to school i got my masters um and then i continued on with my advanced practitioner degree and now i'm doing anesthesia um but that's sort of been the progress over 16 years yeah yeah so this is this is a, a topic clearly from from what you're saying that that hits home personally um, and for, through your own experience of uh experience uh you know experiencing some of the stresses and strains of, of the kind of work that you do. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 So, I, uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, that's, that's okay. Uh, so the, so the other thing I always get curious about with people right from the start, uh, I, I'm a very big believer that it is not a coincidence that most of us who are in the helping professions are in the helping professions, that, uh, this was probably a, a piece of who we have been since we came into the world. Uh, inherently caring and compassionate and intuitive about people and wants to make a difference. So um, 
if I had known you when you were a child, I mean, you know, as a child and adolescent, what might have been some things going on in your life, things you were involved in, ways of being, kind of how you came at the world that was evidence even then that you were eventually going to find yourself in a helping profession? So I think that we, so we moved around as a family. We moved around quite a bit growing up. Um, so every few years it was a new school or a new community. Um, and my mom was always super worried about how am I going to make friends? How am I going to meet people? And she tells the story better than I do, but she <laughs> tells these stories about how I would come home from school and be like, Oh, I met a new friend today. <laughs> and she's like, Oh, how did you, you know, how'd you make a new friend? Tell me all about it. And it would be, you know, the girl that dropped her books or the kid that, you know, was sitting by himself at lunch or, um, you know, someone scraped their knee and I would just run over. And I had all these stories of just how I was meeting people. And as a kid, I just thought, yeah, I'm just meeting all these fun people. And she's like, you seem to always want to help. And I was like, well, yeah, that just seems like the right thing, yeah. you know? Um, so I feel like, you know, from a young age, I just saw that, you know, if someone was alone, I'm like, I want to go sit with that person. I didn't think, Oh, they're alone. Why are they sitting by themselves? I don't want to sit there. It's like, oh, right. Hi, right. I'm new here too. You know, so I feel like all those little small things um, she saw in me as I was growing up. Yeah, sort of yeah. And you know, the beginning. And and you know, today in the adult world, we know that those small things aren't small things, right? Like that that ability to go sit next to the kid who's sitting by him or herself. That's not a small thing in the adult world. Never mind in the child or teenage world. That that's pretty big. It's courageous. It's thinking for yourself. It's acting compassionate and uh, uh, not a small thing. Yeah. So, so clearly those, those traits and characteristics were there from, from the start in making sure oh, that yeah. the world was a better place. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So fill us in. So you, you've had this e experience, as you said, on your own of some level of stress or burnout how did that translate into, because it's one thing to respond to something like that and say, I need to take care of me. That'll be good. And I'm going to just, you know, move on with my career. But, but it's not, you've, you've used that to create a whole kind of this whole other area within your career of, of, of bringing health and wellness uh, to, to your colleagues. So how did that happen? I think it just, it stemmed from, from the lack of, resources that I felt, you know, and I was, I had gone from an environment where I was well supported. We were well staffed. It was, um, you know, it was more prestigious place and there was always people and always money and always, you know, we were the unit that I was on never needed anything. We had the best of the best and the newest. And then when I moved, I moved to a very, um, rural area and there was very few nurses we had, we were so understaffed and the community amongst the nurses themselves was really just sort of every person for themselves. And what actually ended up happening was um, I was wa rushing. I was working nights and I was rushing and I always rushed from one area to the other. And I um, just passed out and I, I had no idea. And I woke up staring at all my coworkers <laughs> being like, oh, you know, what just happened? And I was met with some disdain and um, some definitely some judgment and a lot of really unsupportive habits I was or unsupportive, you know, statements. And lo long story short, I was whisked to the ER and, you know, poked and prodded and tested and all these things. And then my manager was like, you're, you're taking time off. Don't come back for three months. Wow. And I got, you know, sort of, there was no support. There was no, you know, I had to go back to the unit to, to collect my things before, you know, I'd left and I got all sorts of terrible comments. There was no support. There was no, you know, proverbial hand on my back. It was like, maybe you're not cut out for this. You can't hack it. Like mm. maybe you should just consider quitting altogether. So I felt like that piece was missing in the community of nursing. And then as I started to find or to search for resources and, you know, to figure out how did this happen? How can I, you know, make sure this doesn't happen again, you know, get to the sort of bottom of things, the resources really were lacking. So I felt that it was both, both sides of things, both the current environment um, didn't really lend itself to giving us the tools we needed to be successful and to feel supported and to feel like we had that, um, just anything that we needed, the resources, and then going on to the other side of things where now I'm not working, but I'm trying to find how can I be more resilient? How can I practice all these different ways of being a better, better provider, better nurse, but better able to take care of myself. There was just also this huge lack of information. So I felt that 
well, I've lived this and I, I know what I needed to get through it and get to the other side and be a productive, healthy, safe provider. How can I um, do this for other people? Because certainly, you know, there's so many nurses in the, in the world. I'm certainly not alone in having right. felt this way. Right. So one of the things I'm, I'm curious about what I, I referenced earlier, the, the episode I did with Dr. Krasner, and he talked about some research that demonstrated how stressed doctors are before they even leave med school. And so I'm curious with you, based on that reaction you got from, from, your, from your, your colleagues, whether that in any way, shape, or form sounded familiar from the start of your training as a nurse of, of you know, being able to, quote, hack it. I think so. I, I do think so. There's, there's a level of stress. There's also, I feel like, not as, I don't want to say secrecy. I feel like that's probably not the right word, but there was a level of a bit of secrecy when you're training and you're going through things and, and you run up against a difficult personality. It was like, Oh, that's just how they are. We're just, you just keep, keep it moving, keep going, let it roll off your back. And there was never, you're stressed because you don't know the environment you're going to end up practicing in, but you also don't feel like you feel like there's some components of the education along the way missing to give you those tools to be like, yeah, you're going to meet these difficult personalities. You're going to meet these challenges. There was almost like the picture was painted in, in nursing school that everything is wonderful. Everyone gets along perfectly. The patients always do very well. And that's really not setting you up for success. And it does add another level of stress when you even go to your clinical sites, let alone when you're, when you're all finished and you're, you're entering this environment where you're like, Oh, I was, it's not roses and sunshine all the time. Right, right. So so I would imagine, you know, kind of what a kick in the pants that is to feel the stress of, of, the, of the job, of some of the reality of the job, and then the stress of being told, don't be stressed. Or if you are, yeah. it's somehow a weakness of yours. It has nothing to do with the reality of the system you work in. Absolutely. And I think you know, most people in, in the helping professions, we want to help and yeah. we want to, to do whatever we can. And w- when we're not able to meet those needs for our patients or even for ourselves, we feel that shame or that we're failing and that our, our identity of being that provider or that helper, right. that's somehow being undermined. So now it's almost like, you, you don't want to say an identity issue, but that's what you've sort of tied your, your whole identity to is helping. And now you're finding these ways in which you're not meeting your own criteria. So it right. can really be like a mental, a mental game. Almost. Right, right, right. Look, in, in, in my field, um, you know, in my little corner of the helping world, I, I totally relate. I, I don't ever remember anyone ever sitting down early in my career and in, in, and in my schooling saying, Keith, as a therapist, you're fully responsible to make sure change happens. But that was the message I got. That somehow in the in you know in my world of of helping and change, I'm supposed to make it happen, and if it doesn't happen, somehow that's on me, and that's an absolute recipe for for mental health disaster for helping people. But I do believe it's it's there's a current in the helping world about what we're supposed to be able to do and not be able to do, and what's our responsibility, and that is not based on a whole lot of truth. Yeah. yeah. I- I completely agree. Yeah, yeah. So there you are as a nurse, um, you know, working with with hurt and loss and trauma, other people's trauma, uh, and given all we now know about vicarious trauma or secondary trauma for us helping people, the message still was, D, if you're stressed, that's on you. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was, you know... What are, what are you doing at home? What are, what are yeah. you doing? Like, what's, why can't you, you know, you need to leave work at work or you need to leave home at home or it's why, you know, what deficit is in you as a person that you can't meet this need? Right. Right. You know? Right. Has nothing to do with the system you work in, has nothing to do, you know, with, with the severity of the patients you work with. This is, this yeah. is all on you. Yeah. Absolutely. That was very much the message almost from top. Top to bottom or from, from colleague all the way up right. from right. Think healthcare in general. So. Yeah. Well, you know, I was having a conversation the other day with a client of mine who's not in healthcare in another industry, and we were talking about the exact same issue 
where the message within this person's company is, we're a real wellness-oriented company, and we want you to take care of yourself. And you know, they give you a break on going to health clubs and things like that. But what the system's not willing to look at is they expect everyone to work 60 to 70 hours a week and to never say no to a new project. And, um, and if you do, you're seen as not as motivated as the next person, right? So that oh, does yeah. seem to be a, a, a part of some of the systems we work in. So fill us in a little bit more on, uh, on this course that you do and how you actually work with some of your colleagues who uh, come to you and say, Dee, give me a hand with, uh, with how to address uh, the stress that I am feeling. So uh, usually it's, we start with like a little bit of, it's always where the, where the, the nurse is right now. Um, but we start with a little bit of just most motivational interview. You know, why do you want to change? What's, what's not working for you? You know, we make it collaborative and it's never, um, I don't know, it's never accusatory. Everything, the, the big thing I have learned is the anonymity and the confidentiality is such an important piece um, and for people to even come to me and want to talk to me about it, I, I start right away making sure that they understand it's, it's confidential. I'm not telling anyone. I'm not you know, taking that anywhere else. So I feel like they can really be open and tell me what they're committed to doing and what they're trying to do with their health. Um, and so we start with a few ideas of, of what are they really you know, motivated by. And then we see, okay, are you, are you already making changes? Are you just having an idea that you want to make a change and you don't know where to start. So I can sort of meet them where they are with, with their belief in their healthy beliefs. So it's a little bit from the health belief model, but um, like, are you feeling that you're at risk for burnout? Are you already if, having the symptoms? Or are you already thinking about quitting? You know, um, talking about studies before the pandemic, there was a study that was done by the American Nurse Association that 49% of all nurses had thought about leaving the profession within the past two years. Whoa. And that was prior to COVID. So, you know, sort of knowing that baseline information and then talking to the patients and saying, okay, or the, not the patients, I'm sorry, the nurses yeah. and asking, you know, do you feel like this? Do you resonate with this? Um, you know, have you started to do anything on your own? And then how ready are they actually for change? Right. Um, I find that in the initial conversations, like, again, there's the trust and rapport building, um, a lot of nurses don't feel like they've ever actually been heard. Mm. And it's, it's so interesting as, as a nurse as well. Um, I feel like I'm able to get to a deeper level of conversation with them because if they're venting to their family members or friends that aren't in healthcare, there's several other layers of explanation and this is what this means. And this is who this person is. And you can't really get to sort of the depth if you're having to, to go back and explain everything else that you've gone through. Right. So I feel like we're able to get a bit deeper. And then I sort of, you know, their experience is their experience and it's valid and it's real. And I, yes, I'm in healthcare. Yes. I've experienced similar things, but I haven't had their exact experience. So I'm, can listen without judgment and without, you know, putting any of my, my opinions or my perspectives on them. Um, but I also make sure that throughout our course and our, our learnings together that I make sure we're not just focusing on external bureaucratic things. Cause I think, you know, when you ask a nurse what's wrong, you know, the first four or five things they say is going to be, you know, system things, paperwork things, staffing, you know, there's not, there's a lot of focus externally, which, there are a lot of problems with those areas. Those things do need attention. Um, but I try to empower the nurses I work with to focus on what's actually within their control. And like that, those few other things that behind the list of we need, you know, we need better staffing. We need better ratios. We need better pay. Like what can we get to that we can actually affect change with? So that's sort of, sort of what we do. And then we focus on what are, I know people tend to get distracted by big, giant, shiny objects, uh, <laughs> but my goal in, in working with these people, you know, you're, you're in the trauma, you're, it's hard to heal trauma while it's still actively happening. Yeah. And if you're feeling exhausted and burned out, I'm not looking to say, go on a week vacation, you'll feel great, come right, right back. That's just not realistic. I mean, yes, the vacation is nice, but I'm focusing on, if I ask you how your day is and it's a two out of 10, how can we make it plus one better? How can I make you have a three? Right. A three out of a 10 day. We just want to make these small shifts that will have better impact. You know, they're, they're low energy tasks or they're low brain power or they're, they're not going to take up your whole day and they feel very achievable. And just by small incremental 
changes in the way that they want, you know, how, how the nurse perceives they're lacking in their life and what would help make, help make things better for them. We start there. Right. That's where I think most of the change you're most open to allowing change to happen is where you, you feel most comfortable with right. it. And then we work from there. Right. All right. So I got to go back over a whole bunch of this because you hit on all of these just awesome concepts that you bring to your work. I so, so, so relate. So first, um, the use of motivational interviewing. I love hearing that for those of us in the helping world. Uh, it is such an honorable way uh, to help people identify where they are most motivated to change even the littlest thing. And it's not coming from us and it's not, and it, 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 it honors autonomy, right? That it's everybody's Absolutely. process of change. Do you, um, I'm curious, just the, this is veering off a little bit. Do you find that within the field of nursing in general, in the work you do with patients, um, is the use of motivational interviewing strategies and thus the training in motivational interviewing, is, is that pretty widespread among your profession? I don't really think so. I think that it is lacking. I think that that nurses themselves don't utilize it. Right. Um, and I think it it's also stems from the feeling that the cardinal, you know, the sort of unwritten cardinal rule of nursing is that the patient always comes first. Right. So you're focusing on them, but you're thinking of all the different things that are going on with them. You're not really thinking about how, you know, what are, what are my goals? What, what can I do for myself? How can I take care of me? And right. what am I most motivated by? Right. So I think we're able to do it for, for our patients and, you know, right. understand maybe why they're not taking their blood pressure, pressure medication because they can't get to the pharmacy or they can't do this. And we're in problem solving mode for others. Yeah. Um, and we use the patient's motivation to help them make better choices, but we can't <laughs> for some reason turn that internally. Um, I feel like it, should be taught more frequently. It should yeah. be be a subject matter. You know, it's, it's, it's relevant. So. Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine it's relevant before we even talk about like using it for our own health and wellness, like just how relevant that is given the population that, that you are interacting with every day and helping all other human beings figure out where's my motivation to change and, and move my life forward. So I, I just really want to celebrate that. It's, it's a wonderful evidence-based modality. And then I, I heard you talk about something else, and I'm going to put it in, uh, I guess, words that I think of, is um, being sensitive to stages of change, how readiness anyone is in any given moment to not just talk about change, but actually act on change. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because And I try to tie that to the motivation, because if they're motivated and then they have sort of the readiness, I feel like a lot of people find themselves stuck in neutral almost where it's, they can find it and they can complain about it, but they're not really sure they're ready to do something about it. Like they're not ready to not have something to complain about, if that makes sense. So we want to make them feel like they're advancing their health and advancing their wellness in, in the way that they want and that they're motivated to do it. Cause there's a lot of, and I feel like this is probably all over healthcare and not just nursing. There's a lot of Oh no, no, I'm okay. I don't need wellness training, but, but this person, she does, or he right. does this other colleague might need it, but it's not for me. <laughs> so there's a lot of, I don't know, almost like displacement. So yeah. I feel like, all right, we have to make sure you're really ready. And then you're internalizing some things. Right. Right. The, the other, the other strategy you talked about, I'm very curious about, um, because you talked about how, uh, and, you know, I so relate to this in a lot of the work I do, that that very often with some of the nurses you work with, uh, when you start the conversation with them, that some of the first things that come out of their mouth are, are those external issues, systems issues. We need more help. And what I heard you say is that you gently and lovingly push to go deeper. And, and we all know that in our work, to go deeper – requires a greater level of trust and safety in the room than when the conversation first starts. So what are some strategies or, 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 or how you think about that part of your work with people to simply create trust and safety that allows a, a push to go deeper? Because that's a pretty vulnerable make and push for most human beings. So from, from yeah. the time you walk into a room with some of the people you're working with, 
what are some some uh, some things that you do to really shine a light on on creating that trusting space? I feel like it's important. I don't feel like in healthcare the providers' stories are heard, and I feel like a lot of nurses I work with say that they don't feel like they've truly been heard. So, like, there's this like true deep listening, and not listening to respond, just just listening for information gathering and letting them know, you know, I hear you. I know what you're going through. I understand your perspective. Um, and maybe I didn't live it, but I, I honor what you're saying and I, I believe it to be true. I think that in healthcare in general, there's the willingness to believe what our patients tell us. And then if we raise a concern amongst our coworkers, there's a lot of oh no, this is how it is. Oh, my facility doesn't do it that way. Oh, you must be right. You know, there's a lot of judgment and not so much extension of the support and the, the listening. Right. So I just, you know, and most of the people that do approach me at work about this are people I've been working with for a while. So they feel comfortable. And, you know, I try to never discount what someone is saying, even in an interaction, not related to a helping conversation, just in day-to-day interaction. If someone is, has a concern or has just anything who's voicing anything, like I want to make sure they always feel heard and I feel like I'm holding space for them and that they just feel supported in my reactions. Right. So I feel that that trust is so fragile and yes, to start out on the wrong foot or to start out with questions or doubts. I feel like if someone has been bold enough to take that step and come to me for, for help or for assistance or guidance, like I need to be respectful of how brave they were to do that. Right. 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 And, and, you know, your use of the word fragile, how quickly, no matter how well-meaning we are as helpers, that we can move the conversation in a direction that we will never recover from in terms of that person seeing us as trusting. And, and when you talk about that, uh, many of your colleagues tell you there is no place where we feel heard that, 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 that so resonates with me. Um, you know, I, I, I just, uh, did a short video on, on the power of listening and, and my belief that for most of us human beings, we don't have anyone in our life who truly, deeply listens to us in the way you were describing. Right? That doesn't want to fix us, doesn't want to give us a remedy, doesn't want to, well, maybe it's not that bad, truly listens and validates our perception. So that piece towards the creation of that that safe space and holding that safe space, it's it's just a mandatory piece of this work. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And if we don't do that, people are not going to come back and see us. I, I imagine it is such a gift to um, to your colleagues to have this person who who gets it, right? Yeah. Is there, I'm curious, given that you're in the nursing world, because another skill that is sometimes used in the helping professions uh, is is our own self disclosure. So finding some spaces where I might share a little bit of my own experience without oversharing. What's the what's the role of of self disclosure in the work that you do? So I think that you know if if someone is telling me their story and telling me their experience, I I do not interject anything about about what I have been through. Um, usually I find that just in, in conversations with colleagues or, you know, if, if we're in the middle of a surgery and these topics vary and, you know, things are, things are talked about. Um, I just usually volunteer my information or if someone talks about someone that they know who's taken, taken a step back from work or taken time off from work or has gone to see a therapist or a counselor, I feel like prior to COVID, those conversations were really behind closed doors or really frowned upon and people got really nervous in the room and no one wanted to talk about it. But now I use that as an opportunity to show support for that and not to hijack the conversation with my story or anything, but just to show support that, yeah, you know, this burnout and exhaustion happens a lot more frequently than we may realize, even people that you might not have realized. And then it's me. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> and I tell them a bit about my story, um, but just showing support that we need to destigmatize this amongst each other first. Right. Um, you know, and so I feel like by authentically sharing sort of bits and pieces of what I've gone through, other people can see themselves in, in some of, in some of the things I've mentioned or in the things that you know, my coworkers have mentioned or anyone that I have worked with. Um, and then they'll come up to me privately after and be like, Oh, 
did you really do this? Right. Did this really happen? Right. And, and then there's, you know, so I use the, I use the opportunities just to normalize yeah. that. Yes, this happens. This happens to normal everyday people. This happens to really hard workers. This ha- it doesn't happen to, you know, the person that you think is like, Oh, maybe didn't make it through nursing school. It, it happens to everyone. So I'm right. trying to normalize that and use my story to empower other people to step forward and speak yeah. you know, their, their experience. Yeah. So given what you just shared, do you believe that, that although maybe moving in a positive direction, this conversation, the openness and the freedom to have this conversation, to put my hand up as a nurse and say, I- I'm stressed, that that conversation is becoming a bit more acceptable within your profession? I think so. I absolutely do. And not you don't want to say a positive part of COVID or a bright spot because Right. Let's be honest, it's not been very bright at all, but I feel like because everyone has been so disrupted and displaced in healthcare and the workloads have been so shifted, whatever coping mechanisms we had previously um, that might've been keeping us through or just keeping our head above water, you know, it's, those aren't working anymore. Yeah. And it's actually been able to open the conversation of everyone from, you know, I had a conversation a couple of days ago in the OR and it was it was the physician saying how overworked and stressed out they were. And, and the tech in the room also resonated that. And I feel like the conversation, the, the collective we yeah. that feels overwhelmed, exhausted and burned out is, is this greater, it's just a greater amount of people or it seems like a lot more people. So people are more open to it, discussing it. Right. So I feel like it is becoming destigmatized. I think, you know, there's still people that, that will nod along, but don't want to share their story and that's okay too. But there are more people coming forward saying, yes, I know, I know what you're feeling. You're right. You're validated. You know, I'm also feeling this way. Like, right. Right. So. Right. I think that's, that's a, a positive. Yeah, so. Right. Right. So, so maybe, you know, a silver lining might, <laughs> might be the word of, of all of yeah. the horror of, uh, of COVID is, uh, is, as you said, it is, it has brought a level of stress that has, uh, that has gone beyond the normal coping skill of most people. Uh, and you, you know, used a really important point here, and I, I so relate to it in my work in the world of substance use disorder, and, and that's stigma and, and the stigma around uh, being, uh, needing services for, for stress. Um, because one of the things that always strikes me about anything that becomes stigmatized, whether it's language or a certain way of being, maybe in this case, asking for help, is, um, you know, we all know that stigma, it, it judges and it shames and things like that. But one of the things that always strikes me, and it seems relevant to this conversation, is stigma, stigma simplifies the complex. So if I can look at something through a stigmatized lens, you're weak because you need help. I don't have to think about the sheer complexity of this situation in front of me. And, and this is a highly complex issue of of uh, the impact of the work you do and the systems you work in and uh, and what every single individual needs that is different from somebody else. Absolutely. I feel like if you can put a quick, simple title on it yeah. and sweep it under the carpet and look the other way, yeah, it doesn't exist. And yeah. you don't have to maybe face how you're feeling about it or, you know, anyone else in the organization. Yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating phenomena um, in, in lots of different areas of, of healthcare, physical healthcare, mental healthcare, the the whole concept of just what it means for us human beings to raise our hand and ask for help. Um, how how complicated and intricate that process is, and we want to wrap it up into one somewhat judgmental word, and you know, kind of walk away and say, no, not anything I have to worry about. Yeah. So it 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 uh, again maybe a silver lining of um, of what's going what's been going on with COVID. The work that you are doing, uh, I know that you uh, have a position within healthcare. Uh, are you doing this work primarily as an extension of that work, or is this also something kind of in the world of of health and wellness coaching that you are are building as a as an additional uh, piece of what you do professionally? Um, I'm build I'm building it as a standalone thing, you know, to accompany my, my professional pursuits, you know, I'm, it's not affiliated in any way with my hospital or anything. I, I find that 
through the research I've done and the work that I do and the things that I'm learning with, with every client that I have, I'm able to use that in my own practice for my patients and for my coworkers. Um, so that's, that's a very nice bonus that I feel like I'm, I'm better. I'm a better provider. I'm a better colleague, you know, I'm more effective in group conversations from the things that I have learned. Uh, but it is a standalone thing just because it's something I have been passionate about since I had my own experience several years ago. And I feel that there, there still really isn't that support. So I want to be that friendly hand, that like hand on your back, that like hand up, you know, if you're the one lying on the floor, staring at your coworkers, like, how did I get here? Um, I want to be able to help you through that. Right. Right. Yeah, wow. That picture is going to stay in my head D, for quite a while of, of you on the floor, staring up and staring at, at judgment, you know, instead of yeah. staring at somebody reaching down and extending a hand and saying, I get this. Um, that's, that's a, that's a very powerful image, um, of, of where things were and, and hopefully where we're moving from, uh, in this work. Um, so when you, when you engage the, the folks that you are working with in this conversation and you get past that, um, focus on the external issues, if we had more help, all of that, uh, what are you finding that people are uncovering that, that maybe doesn't serve them well in balancing uh, the challenges of this job with the need to, to act on self-care? I think there's, there's a huge undercurrent of just that, the, that I come last, that my needs come last. You know, people will go home and they have a family, they have kids, they have, you know, pets, they have everything comes last, even right. the laundry and the dishes. And, you know, there's, I've worked with some clients who it's, it's actually very heartbreaking. They tell these stories of taking care of patients who have, you know, these certain signs and symptoms and certain things going on and they're, they're in, they had a surgery, they had something and the nurse is recognizing in the patient's retelling of what's going on with them that, Oh, wait a minute. I have these same symptoms. Mm. I've had the same pain or these same things. And I haven't been to my own primary in three, in three years, or I haven't been to my own doctor in this long. And, there's more than once it's happened where these nurses have been like, I neglected my health to such an extent. And here I am taking care of a patient who had the same things that I did and is, has this diagnosis, you know? So I feel like the, the undercurrent of, of having to come last is, is what's primarily being uncovered and then sort of getting to that mindset piece or getting to that almost it's a, sometimes it's a confidence or a self-worth piece of, of helping that person see that they are worth you know, putting their own efforts into and putting their own, you know, their lens on them and saying, how can I take the best care of me? Because right. I feel like there's sometimes they almost feel like they're not important enough or not worth it, or it just doesn't, they're like, oh, I just don't have time for me. And it's, right. you know, I feel like there's a lot of, of mindset shifting that goes into that and a lot of confidence to remind them like, you're important. Here are the things that you've gotten through. Here's why it's important that you take care of yourself to move forward. Right. Right. So. I, I also wonder about that um, just in terms of maybe, you know, a mindset that helps move this conversation forward is, and I'm assuming this happens. So tell me if this assumption is correct or not, that with our increased understanding about uh, stress and secondary trauma on helping people and specifically here with nurses, does there appear to be a growing understanding among the the, the folks that you're working with, that this actually gets in the way of them doing good work so that it's not just about my own health and wellness, but, but as people who really want to help, there's a part of this that if I don't take care of this, there's going to be impact uh, on, on the quality of, of who I am when I walk into to a hospital room and uh, to help the people I'm helping. There is some of that. Um, I think in the initial conversations, it's not very prominent. Right. The nurses I've helped who are sort of on the on the other side looking back, now they see it. They yeah. see that they're you know a better provider, a better colleague, even they're a better parent or a better friend mm. outside of work. They've they've had sort of that transformation, and they can look back and see where all the pieces were lacking. Um, whereas the people at, when I'm in the earlier stages of working with them they will, they will agree that it exists and that they'll probably be a better provider or probably be a better person or better partner afterwards. But I don't think that 
the, the pieces are not always connecting. Right. And I think when you rebroach the subject, when I rebroach the subject with them at the end, sort of as we're more in a, a maintenance and surveillance mode, um, then they look back and they can absolutely identify, you know, that they're more effective. Right. 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 That's an aha moment. Right. Absolutely. And and I love what you just said, because it, it starts to become more universal. It's not just in my role as a nurse. It's in my role as a, a parent, a partner, a spouse, a friend, um, that that uh, I see the benefits of investing this time. Right, right. Yes. Okay. So now I'm really curious, given uh, everything we have talked about, of the impact on nurses of uh, working in this world today. So here you are, uh, both working as a nurse, experiencing all of those stresses and strains, and then you walk out of that and you're working with your colleagues who are feeling their stresses and strains. So in your practice of health and wellness right now, what are some key components uh, that you know are very important in uh, you keeping yourself moving forward? For personally, for me, um, getting outdoors is really important. Even if it's just fresh air, just take going for a walk, just even five minutes of no phone, clearing my mind and just, <laughs> just going for a walk outdoors. Um, I am I'm an avid runner, so I have a treadmill for the winters because in Boston, if there's snow on the ground, I will not be running outside. <laughs> um, but just doing like one small thing for myself every day. And usually it, ha it happens to be an exercise component or just being outdoors to take care of myself. And sometimes I can't even fit that in. So right. I, I'm like, all right, let me choose one healthy thing for dinner or let me have a, a side salad with, you know, if you're, I don't eat meat, but if you're e eating like a burger, like, you know, right. just making one small empowered decision that it's conscious, I'm um, doing this for me. This is one small like step in the yes correct direction where um, my future self would thank me for, you know? So I think that I also try to make sure mentally I hold on to my own peace. So I spend some time either meditating or just, just trying to relax and clear my mind before bed because I have the stresses of, of my work, my, you know, day-to-day -day job. And I have, you know, some secondary trauma, if you will, from all the clients that I work with. And I want to make sure I'm not you know, holding on to my stuff from the day, holding on to their stuff from the day. And eventually you, you run out of space to hold things. Yeah. So you need to, to release them. So I make sure that I try to keep specific boundaries and then just honor how I'm feeling in general as well. Right. Right. So I love what you said about a, a, a daily conscious decision, because that really drives home. I, I think this sometimes is a misconception about how we are supposed to take care of our health and wellness, that it's some monumental decision we have to make or commitment like to, you know, like to a gym or something like that versus can I just find one decision I make a day in, in the name of taking care of me? That's, that's powerful. And I would imagine for a lot of people, not easy to do. It's not, I mean, it's, it's part of, you know, when I work with clients that I, that I talk about that, just that plus one, like whatever you can do plus one and, it's getting into that mindset of trying to figure out what that looks like. And then also not making it too big of a goal. You want to make it achievable. You right. want to make it something you, you barely even think about. And you're, right. you look back and you're like, Oh, I've had all these wins in a row. And I didn't yeah. even realize. Yeah. Cause if you're, if you're pushing the giant rock up the hill every single day, like that's, that's tiring. Yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. Um, the, the other thing you said there, which, which I, I love, cause this is again, part of kind of part of visioning and is, would, would the future me thank me? So talk a little bit about that. That's such an awesome mindset. So I feel like, you know, there's, there's some quote about we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate what we can do in like five years. But I think that we're in the day to day and you're in these habits and you're in these, these sort of routines and if you don't change, then nothing changes, right? Right. Um, but to think about making a change, most people are just these sweeping changes, large changes, big things. And you just say, we're just doing one little thing here. Right. We don't have to reinvent everything. We're just, you know, and it's, you just want to be a little bit better than you were the previous day. And I think breaking it down into that almost simplistic sort of way of saying it helps people get out of their own head. It helps them yeah. stop making it such a big deal. So it's like, oh, yeah maybe I'll take the stairs today or, Oh, maybe I'll, you know, it's, it's something so silly and so simple, but it does add up. So it's like a drop at a time. You're right. filling this bucket. And, and what you're really doing is 
you know, saying, saying, I'm going to do something for myself every single day, one small thing. And if you make it small enough, you know, sometimes you'll have bigger things, but if you make it small enough and you can look back and say, wow, I've done this for a month. Wow. Now it's two months and the time goes by and you start to feel better, you know, and you're doing, you're doing things that will move the needle. No, we're not moving it drastically, but you are slowly moving it and progress is still progress. It's like, the, the analogy I use is, you know, you're sailing a boat and if you turn one degree, one direction, it doesn't really seem like you're off course or on the right course at that point. But if you keep going for a really long time, you're going to end up in a completely different place. And we use that as a positive analogy of where, right. where we're going to go. Right. right, right. That's awesome. It's all about mindset. It's all about mindset, Absolutely. right? How we move our lives forward. What are... So, so I always ask my guests this question because I believe that, that part of the foundation of a really, really good and effective uh, helping conversation is to be strength-based, which, which I hear that you are with all of the folks you work with. So I always get curious with uh, my guests about yours. So I'll give you a second to brag about yourself. What are your some okay. of your strengths, positive attributes, positive characteristics that you bring either to your personal life or your professional life? Let's see. So I think, you know, I think I'm very uh, like professionally, I feel like I'm very approachable and I'm very friendly. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I feel like a lot of people like to come to me especially for in my course and as well as just in patients in general, they feel very comfortable. And I also, I don't like to mince words. I like mm. to be direct, not, not in, you know, a mean way, not in a rude way, but just I don't want to waste your time beating around the bush. If there's yeah. a message that needs to be said or yeah. needs to be heard, Love it. you know, and I feel that with my friendliness, I can, I can soften that to my audience or to whomever I'm talking to, but make sure that I'm, I'm not giving them the all sorts of crazy code that they have to decipher. I'm right. like, I care about you. You're important. And here's the message I want to tell you in the most direct way possible. Yeah. So I feel like that's, that's one of my strengths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, one of the parts of being a coach that, that I, think is one of the most powerful aspects of being a coach is that coaches speak the truth. And as you said, it's not done meanly uh, or maliciously, but there are moments in our work with the people we work with where we could be that person because we've created that, that safe and trusting space that there's enough trust in the room that allows us to say, I'm going to call you on that and I'm going to push you a little bit you know, in the direction you're telling me you want to move. And so, yeah, yeah, I love that. That, that's a, a wonderful, it's a wonder, it, it, I share that, that trait. And, uh, I think in coaching, it serves us well and it serves our clients well, yeah. right. To be the people who Absolutely. will speak the truth. That, yeah, that's awesome. Um, f- f- some of the benefits to you, not, not, I'm going to pull you out of your role as a nurse, and just some of the benefits that you are finding in your life of doing this specific kind of work with your colleagues. I just feel, I do feel like I'm, I'm actually truly making a difference. Yeah. I feel like I'm making more of a difference helping the, helping these nurses and helping the nurses that felt like I did. Right. I feel like I'm doing more, I don't want to say dramatic, but like more, I'm actually moving the needle more for them than I am in my everyday work. Because right. I can, I can see them and I see how they react and I can see just sort of like the relief when they're like, oh, this person actually gets it. This person actually hears me. And you just feel like, I actually feel like I'm making a difference. I know it sounds so silly and, yeah, and not I at all. wanted to pursue this. No, no, it doesn't <laughs> I, sound silly. I've, this has been something that's been so near and dear to my heart. And this happened like eight, almost probably a almost nine years ago at this point. And I have wanted to find a way to connect with people and have it not be a message that's lost. Yeah. And I was trying to find the way to do it. Now I feel like it is resonating with people and I'm like, okay, this is my purpose. I do feel like I am making a huge difference. Yes. So I, every day I wake up and I'm like, all right, I feel like I'm doing something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like yeah. I feel like a little bit of that, you know, purpose. Yeah. yeah, you are. And you know, I, I, I would add, uh, just, you know, as someone who has only known you for about 50 minutes, um, that, that 
uh, my hunch is one of the other items on uh, on your list of strengths is courage. This, this is a very courageous conversation um, because, as you said, from your first experience when you were lying on the floor looking up at judgment, that you know knew and still know this is a tough conversation to move forward in your system uh, for um, for a variety of reasons that we've talked about today. So so yeah, it's making a difference. That's not trite. And uh, and it's a very courageous conversation, and clearly, a a, a needed conversation uh, among your colleagues uh, before COVID, and especially in light of of what you have all experienced in the last year. If one of our listeners, like, what's that? Sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. I was gonna I was gonna say I still feel like um, that young girl that my mom described me as <laughs> helping, but now it's it's me helping. If I saw myself on the ground yeah. and like sort of being that resource that I would be, that I would want to have to awesome. be that resource to someone else. So I feel like I've seen that little girl and I'm like, oh, wait, that's actually me. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sounds like it's who you've always been. And and now, you you know, where X number of years ago you were, you were sitting next to the kid sitting alone at a cafeteria table. Now you are taking on a huge, the huge system of healthcare. And, and giving your colleagues permission to say, I love my job, but there's aspects of it that, that take a toll. Yeah. Yeah. If, if there's a listener right now that, that just happens to be thinking about going into nursing, what would your words of wisdom be as they walk into the field? I would, a couple things perhaps, um, it's absolutely worth it. It really is worth it. Um, you have to just remember that you're doing the best you can every single day for your patients and for yourself. And sometimes that best looks a little bit different depending on how you're feeling or what's going on. As long as you're doing your best, that's all that really matters. And make sure that you take care of yourself along the way. Don't wait for a sign or a symptom right. that tells you you need to take care of yourself. Make sure that you're making yourself a priority from the day one. Um, and then something that I think that every nurse should have, which I started later in life, is like a positivity treasure chest of mm. those days where you felt really impactful for a patient or you felt like you had great colleague interactions or it's just a day. At the end of the day, it's like, what's one thing that went really well today? Um, and you can just write it down like a little blurb or a little sentence or something Um just so you know, because you won't need this, you know, positivity treasure chest if you're having a great day. But on those days where you're really challenged or feeling really exhausted and burned out or feeling like, am I really making a difference? You can look at that and see concrete evidence through as the days have passed, as your shifts have passed, that you actually are. Right. So I feel like right. that's very important. Cool concept. Very, very strength based. That's awesome. Dee, if people were interested in getting in touch with you, what would be the best way for them to do that? Um, on Instagram, you can find me. I'm on, um, turn up your, or yes, turn up your health. Okay. Um, I'm also at turnupyourhealth.com. Um, and for a little bit of a wider variety of what I do, wellnessandhealthcare.com is my website. Awesome. 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 D. Haig, thank you so much. This was such a wonderful conversation, insightful, inspirational, uh, educational, and, uh, and I just hope that everybody out there goes out and uh, if you have a nurse somewhere in your life, you thank them uh, and uh, and make sure that uh, you are doing your best to love them and care for them. And um, and if and if anything about this you know really resonated with you and you are in the nursing field or you're just curious uh, 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 about getting some more information uh, about what D uh, does, um, I will make sure that those uh, those uh, website URLs are in the uh, show notes wherever you happen to listen to uh, the podcast. So again, Dee, thank you so much for being here, and I wish you all the best. Oh, thank you so much. It was my pleasure. So that's it for today, folks. Thank you so much for listening in and being a part of this conversation. Uh, it was, uh, I loved it, and I hope I hope you did too. Uh, it's so important, and, and just the overall message to all of us during these difficult times that many of us are living through uh, to make sure that we're taking good care of ourselves. And if we're struggling with that, to not reach, uh, to not, uh, uh, to not worry about reaching out for help, uh, making sure that that happens and reach out to some people who can give you some support. 
Uh, I hope you're able to join me uh, for our next episode uh, when we continue to shine a light on the skill and talent of individuals like Dee Hake that invite another into that compassionate, complex, and intimate space called The Helping Conversation. Everybody have a great day. We thank you for sitting in on our discussion today on just one unique version of The Helping Conversation. We would love to hear your thoughts on today's podcast, so we sincerely invite you to follow, rate, and most importantly, review our episodes. For more information on Keith Greer and this podcast, log on to keithgreercoaching.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue the exploration and celebration of the practice, art, and science of the helping conversation.